Hello, kia ora, g'day. I'm Heather Morris, the author of The Tattooist of Auschwitz. You're going to be listening to the story behind my story. I hope you enjoy and thank you for listening. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Heather Morris. Today's episode is sponsored by editor Ellen Campbell. Authors, if you are looking for someone to help shape your words into what you originally intended them to be, Ellen uh, can help you do that. Ellen is one of the most sought after indie editors out today, and she is one of the best. I've used her. So many other people in the community have used her. There's a link to her website in the show notes. I'll be talking more about her as the month goes on. Also, thanks to R.J. Panero, his upcoming book, Avenue of Regrets, is an engrossing psychological thriller. Coming up in November, we're going to be talking about it more this month and talking with R.J. Thanks to him for sponsoring the show. As always, after the show, there's an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Heather Morris as my guest on the show. Uh, Heather is the author of a, uh, a novel called The Tattooist of Auschwitz, and this is one of those books uh, that gets called hauntingly beautiful. Uh, I think I, I saw it uh, in, in a review and the, those terms seem to be uh, at odds, uh, maybe an oxymoron. But when you read this book, you'll know exactly what that uh, what that description means. Uh, Heather, this book has moved me on a very, very deep level, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. And my pleasure to be here speaking with you. Heather, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, it wasn't as a child, I have to admit. It was actually when I had a child of my own, and that was a long time ago, you know, 40 years plus years ago. And we were poor. We didn't have money for the books that we wanted to buy him. And reading was always important to both my husband and I. And so I started creating little children's stories for him and just writing them in a very cheap exercise book. And my husband would then illustrate them. But I noticed even back then that those stories, I was actually grabbing characters or characteristics from people I knew than that Real life for me was way more interesting than than fantasy, of which I think my brain doesn't really go there. Wow, that's a. Uh, uh, it's so interesting that uh, that the the storytelling kind of uh, uh, awoken in you later in life. Um, it, but the you know sharing those stories with with a child uh is a pretty powerful experience uh i would think and mm -hmm. uh, i you know some people say that they they knew they were going to be a writer from the time they were you know 2 years old or or whatever um but what kinds of stories did you did you share with your son i i know uh, talking about later in life but at that point i think i was actually in my early 20s so i really wasn't sure. quite that lengthy <laughs> I, uh, the stories that we created were around characters that were actually living at the time, but we made them into, into cartoon-type characters. And I'm talking about popular culture people at the time. A little series, and we had, well, it was more than a little, but we went for quite a few uh, exercise books, and it was about gloves, the little things that boys and girls put on their hands. But each glove that we created could be related to somebody in the real world. We had a Michael Jackson glove. We had a Queen Elizabeth glove. We had a gardener's glove. And so we created these stories around real people in real times doing real jobs and just wove stories that 
and how they came together. And it was bringing together people from different walks of life who ordinarily probably didn't. Wow. Um, were, you, uh, were you a stay-at-home mom uh, at the time with your son? For the most part, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think after two or three years, I might have got a, a, a job. In fact, I did just working, say, one day on a weekend when, when hubby was home. But uh, for the most part, yes, those early years. Yeah. Um, you uh, you began uh, working in, in social work uh, sometime along the way, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. That was probably, what, 20 years later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Three children, a change of country, and uh, the desire as a mature adult to say, hang on a sec, I missed out on something here. And that was called um, a university education. Mm. So I sent myself back to university with three small children. Uh, now, you, you said that you changed country. Um, you do not have a typical American accent. Uh, where Where are you from in the world? Well, I'm currently living in Australia and have been for many years, but I'm from New Zealand, so I have this sort of mixed Kiwi Aussie thing going for me. I can say kia ora and I can say g'day <laughs> equally as well. <laughs> uh, that that is a magical part of the world, especially from from those of us on the other side of the equator. Uh, we look mm-hmm. uh, at, uh, at at Australia and and New Zealand, and you know we we think of Lord of the Rings and uh, this this absolutely magical, fantastical place. Uh, do do you ever feel like that? Uh, that the place that you're from affects the way you see the world and and maybe the the stories that you tell. Oh, absolutely! Um, and just yeah, referencing Lord of the Rings, where I actually grew up as a fifth generation Kiwi, was within an hour's drive of Hobbiton oh. in the middle of the island. <laughs> oh man, how fantastic! How fantastic! Yeah, and so you know, one of those sort of you don't realize at the time that it really was an idyllic setting to be living in as a young child. Yeah, the countryside, uh, rolling hills, beautiful scenery, which you did not appreciate, except that, wow, you had the privilege of luck of having a river uh, at the end of your farm that you could go and fish in and a mountain that you could go exploring and all those things that, yeah, you get them everywhere. But in terms of uh, who it made me, well, it made me in some ways a bit of a loner because I was on a farm and I had four brothers. And so to me, walking off and being on my own yeah, was a great chunk of my childhood. Yeah. We, we couldn't go out to school and play with friends or on weekends go and hang out. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you feel like those times where you felt uh, alone, uh, did that stoke your imagination? Uh, maybe, maybe you didn't know it then, but looking back now, do you see some of those times as uh, a good exercise for the for the writer's imagination? Oh, absolutely! Because um, one of my pet loves, we had we were on a dairy farm, so we had sort of two or three hundred cows who were wandering around, and cows are pretty amiable creatures. <laughs> yeah, and you could you could walk into a paddock full of cows, and I, I had given them all names. And um, and I would often apparently be found trying to get my cows to act out little plays that I was putting together and trying to move <laughs> one of them from one place to another. Um, oh, so, yeah, yeah, crazy stuff, but, you know, I'd, I'd talk to the cows. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, that's so funny. Um, when you decided to go back and pursue that uh, university education, uh, what were you studying? I started off with an arts degree, so actually it was politics. So part of me is sort of quite driven by the need to understand the big political picture out there. Well, good luck and, with that. Uh, yeah, I know. It's getting more and more difficult. Yes. <laughs> I need to go back to school, I think. It oh, keeps changing for me. Right. Uh, and sociology. So they were the areas of, uh, of interest, which is the big political picture, but also always needing to know what was going on at the ground level at that sort of social, individual, small community settings and, and how those two should be actually working together, not bloody pulling apart. Right. Well, to, to gravely oversimplify it, um, uh, sociology is, is kind of the study of, of human behavior and how we interact with one another, isn't it? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Which is uh, how we just want to shoot each other down. Right. Well, that is, that is great training, uh, for a writer who, who wants to, uh, write stories that try to dissect maybe 
um, what people are doing to one another, how, how they are, uh, behaving and, and maybe try to make some sense, uh, out of horrific things that have happened, uh, yeah. as you do in this book. Uh, I would think that that's pretty good training to, to train the writer's eye toward those things. Absolutely, and it helped that the hospital I worked in is a large hospital here in Melbourne, probably the, the biggest, if not was maybe second biggest. And and being a, a trauma hospital, my day to day was what's coming overnight, uh, what am I dealing with today? And it was mostly you know tragedy and trauma. Uh, so yeah, that was the day to day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at what point, Heather, did did you decide to to begin writing in earnest? Um, what what where along the journey did uh, did it strike you that, you know, I might have a story to tell? When the youngest child got to that point where I could tell her to leave me alone and mean it. <laughs> right. Um, and it literally was when, the, as I say, your children start getting older and you've got time on your hands and you think back, hang on, well, I went to university while they were young because that was one of my boxes I wanted checked. And then the next one was, well, I want to tell stories. So how do I want to tell stories? I love movies as much as I love reading. And so I decided I would learn the craft in screenwriting and spent several years both in Australia and coming to the US to go to conferences and workshops because I wanted to be able to learn to write screenplays. And that is what I did. And I have two or three, maybe more, in my bottom drawer of my desk. Uh, I'm just sitting here waiting, anyone out there listening here. Yeah. They can't have the tattooist of Auschwitz. It's gone. But I have others. Oh, Heather, what is the – I'm really fascinated by screenwriters uh, because you are able to, to take the essence of a story and really distill it down uh, to, to kind of its bare minimum – uh, while being able to, to cast a vision, uh, so to speak for the person reading the script that then they can interpret to, to the screen. Um, a, a, as someone with experience in both, uh, other than just kind of the mechanics of it and, and a, a screenplay tends to be more, you know, mostly dialogue and some, uh, and some descriptors, uh, when writing these two forms, uh, how, how do they differ for you? Well, I think screenwriting to me, I found was, if you wanted to have anybody read the thing, it was formulaic. Here were your instructions and your rules and do not bend them unless your name's Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, yeah, three acts, you know, first 10 pages, beat, 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 hit those targets. And once you learn that, you then get, well, other than me, I then became quite structured in making sure when writing the, the tattooist that I did hit those beats. And I did hit the targets of first act, second act, middle, third. And actually that came in really, really handy for me when I did make that transition to what was essentially adapting a screenplay into a book. So I did it, you know, back to front to a, a lot of stories. And, um, yeah, it was then a matter of, you know, hey, I have the privilege now of fleshing all this out. Right. But yes, they're very, very different, as you would know. Right, right. Um, when uh, when did the idea for the tattooist uh, come to you? It came to me because I chose to have a cup of coffee with a friend one day, and who casually said to me, "Oh, by the way, I have a friend whose mother's just died, and his father has asked him to find someone he can tell a story to, and that person can't be Jewish." And my friend was Jewish. She knew I wasn't. She said, do you want to meet him? And I said, yes. And so a week later, I knocked on the door of Lali Sokolov. Wow. As simple as saying yes to a cup of coffee. Wow. Y y yeah. Um, there, I, I have learned in life uh, that uh, learn to say yes a lot more than, than I say no. Uh, <laughs> because Absolutely. I know you've got a damn good reason for saying no. It yeah, try try the yes first. Exactly, exactly. Uh, wow. So, uh, why the requirement uh, that the the person receiving the story not be Jewish? Do you did did he explain? Yes, he did, and um, he was very very clear on that. There was to be no if buts or maybes. He wanted to speak to somebody and tell his story, 
to somebody who had no baggage, no family history, no connection with the Holocaust whatsoever, that he knew could relate his story the way he wanted it told. And uh, look, I've been told by thousands of people now and talks all around the world where I've been, that uh, maybe Lully was a smart cookie doing that. Even many, many Jewish people from the London synagogue to here in Australia and other places, they okay, he got it right, yes, we would have told it differently. Now, one of the things that we've established that makes the book more accessible, if I can say that, to non-Jewish people is by my not having any background in Judaism or even in the Holocaust other than the bare basics that we all got, I could not write any of the Jewish culture or the the idioms or the, the phrases into my book. So I was never going to have it unaccessible to people who did not understand that race and that culture. And that seems to have worked for me. Yeah, I, I'll say so. Um, so what was that initial meeting like uh, when you met him? Uh, and Rick, in some ways, quite sort of traumatic for me because I didn't know who I was meeting and I didn't know why I was really meeting him. And he was an 87-year-old man whose wife had just died. He was so grief-stricken. And the whole two hours I spent with him, just letting him talk, He couldn't talk in a coherent sentence. He couldn't link any of his stories together. And he kept telling me and asking me, how quickly can you write this? Because I need to be with Gita. Hurry up and write this. I need to be with Gita. And he, more often than not, was clutching a photo of her to his chest. So it was a, oh, wow, yes, what am I going to do here? Is there anything here worth um, my trying to help him with? And after two hours, I decided that you've had enough here. Let's just call it, and can I come back and see you in a couple of days? And so it was good two or three weeks of me going to see him two or three times a week before I decided or realized that, oh, my goodness, what have I got here? Because he was not capable of telling me a story in any sort of linear fashion. I'm just hearing words, Tatavera, Mengele, Hess, all these people who the history books tell me they're somebody. Right. And um, But more importantly, what I was hearing is his love for this girl, this 18-year-old girl whose arm he held as he tattooed her number. He never called it tattooing, by the way. He called it numbering. Mm. I made her number, he said. I made her number. And I looked in her eyes. And he could tell me 60 years later that he knew in that second he would never love another. Now, there was my story. Wow. So who, who is uh, Lali Sokolo? Who, who was this character? Lali Sokolov was a 25-year-old playboy, a man about town, a love him and leave him kind of guy, who was leading the good life in Bratislava and Slovakia. He had the good job. He wore the fine suits. He dined at the best restaurants and had a string of girlfriends, and then he found himself in Auschwitz. So for him, that kind of change was incredibly dramatic, but he was also a very smart cookie. He spoke five languages, and he had a certain degree of being able to manipulate, I think, people right from the get-go, and he definitely was what I would call an opportunist. Mm. He saw opportunities, he took them. But he said he only ever took them by assessing what was going on around him. Never took a step anywhere without looking around. Is there danger anywhere? He carried that also, not only from his time in a death camp, but uh, into his life, all his life, in business. Everything about life was assess your environment and then react. Uh, one thing that, that really struck me about the character is, uh, that he is not your typical, um, what's, what's the right word? He's not your typical hero, um, protagonist. Uh, he, I think you, you summed it up greatly, uh, in my initial reactions. He's an opportunist. He's, um, uh, you know, and, and this is the kind of character that, uh, 
when we look back uh, through our history lessons, because uh, you know I'm I'm a good generation and a half uh, removed from from World War II. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, everything I, you know, think about that is filtered through the things I've been taught and, and, uh, you know, we, we do a really good job of, of cleaning up history, uh, as time goes oh, by. We sanitize it. Yes, we do. Yeah. And, and we, we have these, these visions of people and they are, you know, we've got the good guys <laughs> on the right and the bad guys on the left and, 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 and then, uh, you know, victims, uh, you know, uh, fall in these very uh, specific categories. And, uh, and then you look, when you really start looking, people are just people and they find themselves in bad situations and they, they look for opportunity and, and they're just, they're very human characters, uh, in this book. Uh, as, as he's telling you these stories, um, when did you start, uh, getting the thread of the story and you said at first they were just kind of all over the place and and not linear in any way when did you really start getting the sense of what the narrative thread was going to be probably not for a good three or four months of our relationship and uh, it was clear to me that he was actually holding out on me that just a lot of the things he was giving me or the information he was giving me I possibly could have found in the history books or on Google, except for the fact of who he was and what his role was in the camp. Now, that was very unique, and there I was finding nothing. Um, and when you look at it and the documentaries and the books out there, they all talk about the fact that all the prisoners in Auschwitz, and, and that was the first realisation to me that, Auschwitz-Birkenau was the only camp where prisoners were tattooed. And so my knowledge or my thinking that all the concentration camps did this was wrong. Yeah, I didn't realize that either. It was just the one camp. And so anybody who bears a tattooed number on their left arm at some point went through Auschwitz-Birkenau. So uh, that was what I'm starting to learn. This man knows more than he's giving me. Particularly, he wasn't giving me that deep love story. And then something happened one day, a good, good four or five months into our friendship. And whenever we sat down in his home to talk, one or he had two dogs. One of them was about the size of a small pony. And they would constantly bring him a tennis ball and he would throw it over his shoulder and they'd fight for it and race around the lounge room looking, you know, finding it. And then one day the big dog, her name was Tootsie, the poor thing, she came up with a tennis ball and Lully reached down to take it out of her mouth and she growled at him and wouldn't release it. He tried again and got another growl and he gave her a little tap on the head and go, Naughty Tootsie, give me the ball. No, Tootsie turned around and she put her head on my knee. I took the tennis ball out of her mouth. I threw it over my shoulder and she and Bam Bam raced after it. And that was the moment that Lully looked at me and went, Ah, my doggies like you. I like you. <laughs> you can tell my story. And that literally was the moment I think he actually did decide then and there. And uh, we then embarked on this, what I can only call an unburdening for him, and the transference of that trauma and tragedy and evil that he had witnessed and been part of, moving from him onto me. And, uh, yeah. It was so obvious. It was visible emotionally and physically as all of a sudden he stopped talking about wanting to be with Gita. He started saying, well, can we go out for coffee today? And given that he made the worst coffee imaginable, I was always going to say yes to that. (laughs) And we started going to movies and we started going to social events in the Jewish community that he had withdrawn from. And he started telling me about what it was like for him and Gita trying to be together. He started telling me about what he had seen in the hospital where those evil, evil men in white coats practiced. Now, you only get a very, very small snippet of what he's told me in the book, particularly about the evil that he saw. I can imagine. Uh, this is the, the most unlikely, uh, of places and circumstances, uh, for a love story to emerge. Uh, and 
uh, you said that he was kind of cagey at first about the the love story that you wanted him to to tell more about that and it it sounds like you you had to earn his trust and and earn the trust yeah. of, of his animals who who he he put great faith in in their uh, ability to, to to uh you know distinguish a friend from foe yeah uh, when when he finally let that wall down and and started uh kind of uh you know rejoining society and taking you along with him and and uh, i i assume kind of making peace with with things uh did the story from him come more fluidly what did it stop uh being stops and starts and little vignettes here and there uh was he able to uh to really connect with with the story he was trying to tell you at that point yes he did um and twofold actually yes he could then tell me a complete story as it happened and I, I would look at him and i'd see him literally go back to that time and place but he also went from being quite clinical in what he was telling me to being very emotional and so i did find myself now more and more often sitting with him with tears rolling down his eyes and his voice quivering and his hands shaking so when that happened and when that change took place you know you're getting the guts of the story and luckily my training uh, allowed me to know when to stop him when to start to slow him down and when to start shutting him down and getting out of the situation that i could see him physically being transported back into and and that's why it took you know many many months because i would not allow him to stay in that time and place for too long was both protecting him and pre- protecting myself. Sure, sure. Um, we've had uh, a number of books in the last year or two uh, that that deal with this time period, and uh, I, I've talked with several of those authors, and uh, and, and we've talked about the uh, the kind of resurging interest in this time period, and 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 wondering why these stories all seem to be coming out. Um, uh, close together and, and there seems to be a renewed interest. And, uh, I, I posited that, uh, that maybe because a lot of these, um, uh, a, a lot of our veterans, a lot of the people that live through this, uh, are beginning to, to, to die off and we will mm-hmm. lose the, the story if we don't get these stories written down and shared, uh, because the, the only people that can really tell the story because they were there, uh, are all leaving us. Uh, you know, time is, is marching on, uh, you know, whether we're ready or not. Um, when, when writing this, did you ever have that feeling, uh, like if I don't get the story down, uh, we're going to lose, you know, what really happened here and no one will ever know. Oh, absolutely, and it literally is a, a matter of uh, time and place for these people, and I've been privileged to meet many, many other survivors, all of whom freely admitted to me there was no way I was going to tell my children of what I survived. And, hey, I'm a mom. I get that. Can you imagine looking into the face of your child and trying to tell them the horror and the evil that you'd lived through and seeing the pain that that would bring to them? So we're finding that when this is some research that that I've done and my publishers have done, that a lot of the survivors, not only of the Holocaust, but from other atrocities and genocides, while they don't want to talk to their own children and have kept them largely ignorant, they are finding they're quite happy to talk to the second generation. And now they are happy to talk to strangers. In fact, they find comfort in talking to strangers and so many of Lully's friends here, other survivors. And I need to tell you that Australia got the second largest number of Holocaust survivors outside Israel. Wow. So Melbourne and Sydney uh, are two large, large uh, communities of, of survivors. And naturally now they're uh, first and second generation families. And so there's many stories to be told here. And I've met many of them. And they are now and were saying to me, can I tell you my story too? Will you write my story? And with lack of time, I've been able to encourage them to find somebody else and put them in touch with professional people who will record their story, even if it's only just 
for their family to hear about after they've gone. Right, right. Um, Heather, as, as someone who, who never intended to set out on this path, uh, and mm-hmm. now to become the author who, who so beautifully captured this story, uh, what does that, what does that do to you? Um, when you start thinking about, uh, and, and looking back on, on the course of your life, um, did you ever imagine that you would be connected to something as powerful as this? No, no, and no. <laughs> and, um, and as my husband keeps pointing out to me, this is not how I pictured our retirement. I said, oh, you don't want to come traveling the world with me telling this amazing story. And he says, I'll come. <laughs> so, no, look, it has uh, led not only me uh, personally, but my entire family, because my entire family knew Lully. He, he became part of... Um, our family. And so, yes, I'm out there now um, talking to amazing people like yourself and constantly stunned and amazed that people do want to hear and talk me talk. Um, and all I can do is try and honour not only Lali and Gita, but all those people who both survived and didn't survive by letting as many people who want to know about their story hear it and hear it firsthand from me. And, uh, yes, so while I'm still fit, okay, I can't claim the young part anymore. Uh, and I'm leaving in six days' time for another five weeks in Europe. Oh, wow. Uh, that'll be my third trip there since April. How wonderful. Uh, yes, and uh, and here it's just traveling Australia and New Zealand, and I hope to be able to get the chance to come to uh, your neck of the woods too. Oh, we would love to see you. We would love to see I, you. Um, I've been dropping hints to the publishers. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, yes, if, look, look, and how it's changed me, um, it's made me, look, you get to my age and what changes is you realise that maybe there is more that you can give that you may not have been giving while you were bringing up children and having the day-to-day life. Uh, and, yeah, for me going forward, this story and the, the current one I'm writing, which is a character out of the book, uh, her story's got to be told. And so I do feel this overwhelming need to make sure that more of these stories are out there and written, hopefully in the same vein as the tattooists, so that people will want to read them. Uh, Heather, th- this book is, uh, uh, is a fictional account of, of the real story. Um, it, you, you spent time with the real Lolly and, and you got the story. Uh, where, where does it become fiction and where, uh, is the real story? As readers, will we ever know what things you interjected and, and what was real? Oh, absolutely. Um, I want you to know that. You know, the, the publishers said to me, oh, well, you have to write a memoir. And I went, okay, all right. So off to memoir school, I went for a day. It was meant to be a five-day course. I lasted one day. And I very quickly realized that if I told this as a memoir or biography, there goes Gita. She's out of the picture, except for the time she was with Lully, because I could not tell or, yeah, put into the, the book her side of the story and what it was like for her. I would have to tell only what Lully saw or witnessed or knew about. When it came to telling the part where he was playing a game of football with the SS, I couldn't give the players names and he couldn't remember them. They would have to be player one and player two. The restraints on writing this of memoir would not allow me to put dialogue in them. And, hey, we've just discussed how as writing screenplays, it's dialogue, dialogue. Oh, you can't have dialogue in a memoir. <laughs> um, so that went. And so what has been created is the, some of the dialogue, particularly between the girls in the camp because I had to make that up. Um, what has been created are the names of some of the people in the book and mostly the soccer players because uh, he couldn't remember them. All those other, you know, people, the bees I call them, the bad people, their names are, are there. You, you want to know who the commandant of uh, Birkenau was? It was a guy called Schwartz, Schwarzhuber and his offsider was Hustek. Uh what I other, the only other thing I really created was I put Lully and Gita together in the book one time when in reality they weren't. And that was a scene when the Allies flew their planes over the camp. 
everything else, 90% of it is as witnessed, as seen, as experienced by Lolly. And the information I got about Gita, I got that from watching her show a tape. Thank you, Steven Spielberg, for what you did after making Schindler's List. You sent people all around the world to record the testimonies of survivors. And they came to Australia. Lully made a tape. Gita didn't want to because Gita never spoke about their time in the camp to anybody but Lully. And on the last day that those people were in Melbourne, Lully finally said to her, if you do not tell your story, it will be lost for all time. So she did. She made a tape for the Shoah Foundation on the condition that Lully never watch it. And he never did, but he gave it to me to watch. I I can't imagine the weight of that, Heather. What mm. what that must feel like to to be that connection that that he couldn't be. Yeah. Ah, uh, look, it was massive, and it all came down to, well, what do I tell? Here was a woman who wanted her life kept secret, and so where do I sort of break that um, and take some kind of liberty? in telling the world what it was like for Gita and with Lully's blessing. And he got to read the the screenplays. He never got to read the book because uh, he's uh, been dead now for some years. But he did read the screenplay to many drafts and he was delighted with my portrayal of Gita. And their son, I'm so delighted when after he read the manuscript in which he learned many things about his parents that he didn't know, which was quite funny really. But he did say to me, how did you get my mother so well when you never met her? Oh, wow. And said, you know, you can thank your dad for that. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Heather, I- I'll tell you what the book did for me. And, and then uh, I- I'd like for you to uh, to share what, what you hope people get out of this book. Um, w- one thing that, that really... Um, uh, that this book did for me is it, it allowed me, uh, to put very human faces on, uh, on a, uh, a, a tragedy so big that we can't really wrap our heads around it. Um, an, an atrocity so big that, that we can't, um, that, that we can't even deal with it, uh, because it just seems so big and it seems so impersonal and it seems so, um, just horrendous and and you have allowed me um to to step into this situation alongside these people and see that these were these were very real humans uh with 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 loves and desires and dreams and hopes uh but also flaws and uh they're just human, just like me. And and I yeah. think that that makes the story so, so powerful. Um, uh, that That's what it did for me. W- what do um, you hope people take away from the story? Well, you pretty much nailed it on the head there. And um, I can back that up with your interpretation with something that happened to me in April this year when I was actually in Auschwitz. I was there as part of uh, an organization called the March of the Living where young 16 and 17 year old Jewish students from around the world gather for a week of, of education in, in Krakow and going to Auschwitz and Birkenau. And I got to speak to actually many, many Americans because there was a large contingent there from America. And I spoke to Americans from Florida and from New York and from LA. And the, the minders, they're, they're adults, the, the psychologists that were accompanying them, the teachers, the rabbis, the counselors. After I had been speaking to them, several of them came to me the next day and said, we were watching these youngsters while you were talking, and I'm talking about hundreds of them at a time, and we were watching how they became so engaged with your story, and we started asking them afterwards in the next day, what was it about listening to Heather talk that was different for you because you were all reacting differently? And they said to a person, they just said, oh, it was simple, really. You know, we've been here now for two or three days. We've heard all these guides telling us about six million of us died in the Holocaust 
Over one million died here where we're standing in Auschwitz. And we couldn't picture that. We couldn't relate to six million. Right. But we could relate to one. Mm. And we found we could relate to Lali and Gita, particularly when I pointed out to them that Gita was their age. Mm. And so, yeah, that's what um, I think people are taking from it, that you can relate to the one. Right. Uh, and then by doing that, you get the picture of the other six million. Right. Right. Because I have not told the story of the Holocaust. I've just told a Holocaust story. Right. We, and and in that context becomes more powerful almost uh, because you can you can begin to empathize. You can begin to get an emotional connection to the one to the two. Uh, yeah. That where where yeah, six million is just it, it's impossible to. It's uh, a number. Yeah, it, it's a number. You can't process that. No. Uh, but Lolly and Gita uh, become a part of you before the story's over, and uh, and this is one of those books that you will walk around with with these characters uh, in you for for quite some time. And I love the fact that I persuaded the publishers to allow me to put some photos in the back. Because of normally a book of fiction, and yes, this has to be classified as, as fiction, you don't normally have photos in the back. Now, such has been the response to those three simple photos that a new edition um, or version of the book coming out in the UK this month, because it's been out in the UK since January, now has got over 12 photos in the back because of the demand from people. We want more. And we've also included... Um, some copies of some of the documents that I got or that my researchers got out of Auschwitz. Um, yeah, so we're now finding that people are wanting more, not less. Absolutely. Absolutely. Heather, the, the book is extremely powerful, um, but not just powerful in a um, – in a in an academic way, uh, it, it's powerful in a, in a very emotionally connected way. Um, thank you uh, for writing this book, um, just from me personally. Um, but I hope other people find this book and it moves them uh, in the same way that it did me. Uh, if people are just learning about you and the book, uh, where can they find you online? Maybe to learn more about uh, what you do and uh, more of the story behind the story. Um, yes, I do have a website. <laughs> Thankfully, there are people in my life capable of creating <laughs> these things. It literally is um, my name, heathermorris.com, yeah, with the right WWs in front of it. And, um, yeah, look, Nihal Lali said time and time again that his survival was because he was lucky, lucky, lucky. I also say my telling this story was because I got lucky, lucky, lucky. I love it. I love it. Um, it. And what an amazing story it is. Um, Heather, thank you so much uh, for taking time to come on the show with me today. Oh, thank you. It'll be my absolute privilege. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He led Jason to a small bistro. The door set tiny bells to chime as they entered. The place shivered with smells. Coffee, hot chocolate, and croissants. This, he said, extending his arm towards a woman in an apron, is Jennifer. She makes the best scones and is tragically spoken for. He kissed the woman's hand. She was plump in her fifties. She had left one curler to dangle at the back of her head this morning. If it's a tragedy to you, this is the first I've heard of it. She swatted at him with a menu. Why didn't you speak up twenty years ago, lady killer? Jason sat. Jennifer put a glass of water in front of him. And who is this fine gentleman? This, said Hedwick, joining, is my son's great-grandfather's great-great-nephew. That's a lot of greats. Any great-great-great-whatever of Hedwick is great by me. She giggled at her own wit. I'll be back for your orders. Hedwick swatted her rear end with a menu as she left. He made small talk about the bistro, the specials, what was good, the Benedict, or not so, the hanger steak. 
When their orders came, coffee for both, eggs for Jason, a scone for himself, he got down to business. I met your grandmother about, oh, a year ago. Valerie and I have a mutual interest in old families, particularly old families related to the legend, for obvious reasons. Valerie's lived in Terrytown for years, though her family's up near Boston. Now don't worry, I don't believe all that nonsense about a headless horseman. Valerie's the superstitious one. But the Van Brunts are definitely the family in Irving's story. Hermanus Van Brunt and his wife Agatha were farmers in the village back in 1780 or so. This was during the Revolution. Hermanus grabbed title to lands left by a Tory family who'd been tarred and feathered and shipped back to Britain. Do you know your history? Sure, Tory, loyal to the king. Benjamin Franklin broke with his own son who was a Tory. Smart boy. Traitors to the cause. And that was serious business. The British marched straight through here during the war, chased George Washington off Manhattan and out to New Jersey. And after they were kicked out again, a lot of Tories were kicked out with them. Anyway, the Van Brunts took over some farmland north of Terrytown. They had a son, Abraham. And, of course, their son Abraham married a wealthy heiress. Katrina Van Tassel. Yes. All that is true. It's public record, just like the legend says. My mother left behind quite a few documents written by Abraham Van Brunt. Brahm. In Dutch, mostly. He was powerful around here. With Katrina's money, he became the biggest stone merchant in the state. He died in 1850. After him, it's Dylan Van Brunt, his son Joseph, the grandson, then Cornelius, then... Sorry, genealogy is not my thing. No? Why was Eliza doing research on the Van Brunts? She wasn't. She was looking into the cranes. That's what made us such fast friends. I don't get it. We do go back a ways, your family and mine. More coffee? Jennifer appeared at Jason's elbow. Hedwick nodded and she poured. Still not getting it, said Jason. But he did. Hedwick turned to the waitress and Jason knew what he would say. My lady, may I present? He raised his coffee cup, proclaiming, The last descendant of Ichabod Crane. <laughs>